Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 114. It's about then, what was happening a hundred years ago in the aftermath of World War I. And it's about now, how World War I is being remembered and commemorated, written about and discussed, but most important. The podcast is about why and how we'll never let those events fall back into the mists of obscurity. So join us as we explore the many facets of World War I then and now. This week on the show, we're going to explore the headlines in the news 100 years ago in the third week of March 1919. Mike Schuster highlights the re-emergence of imperial postures at the peace conference. Historian, educator, and author Maury Klein helps us make the connection between the Great War and the Great Depression. Dr. Edward Lengel brings us the story of a pioneering American woman doctor in World War I. And for Spotlight on the Media, we bring you the story of a World War I cantata commissioned for the Armistice Centennial. In Flash News, we have the results of our Facebook poll, our canine competition for 2019 World War I dog hero. Is it Rags or is it Stubby? Well, You'll just have to listen. This week on World War I Centennial News, which is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, the Star Foundation, the General Motors Foundation, as well as the good people of Walmart. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist of the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. a hundred years ago this week. The third week of March in 1919 is a dynamic one. It's tax season and some of the war bonds are coming due. Wilson gets back to Paris and the complexity of the peace conference rears its many heads like a hydra. Famine relief for Germany progresses. A beer and prohibition still hit the headlines as they do pretty much every week. Whether the League of Nations is an integral part of the peace treaty or a separate idea becomes a critical issue. And coming out of the war in the sky, flying a plane across the Atlantic Ocean hits the headlines a few times this week. Now with that as a setup, let's jump into our centennial time machine and go back 100 years ago this week to read the headlines in the news. Dateline, Saturday, March 15, 1919. Headline, May reach billion in first receipts from income tax. Washington expects reports from 4 million individuals and business concerns. Midnight is the time limit for taxpayers to file their returns. Payment of $800 million in treasury certificates to counterbalance flood of money. Offices here are swamped. So apparently, March 15th, not April 10th, is when taxes were due in 1919. Headline, Wilson in Paris, opens conferences, aims to hurry along peace work. New problems for Wilson. Many issues apparently in conflict with American principles await Wilson's decision. And our last headline for Saturday, March 15. Headline, Cotin condemned to death by court-martial for his attempt to kill Premier Clemenceau. Emile Cotin, the anarchist who recently made an attempt upon the life of Premier George Clemenceau, was today sentenced to death by court-martial, which was trying him. This verdict was unanimous. Dateline, Sunday, March 16, 1919. Headline, American World War Veterans Begin Organization in France. Paris, 500 officers and enlisted men of the American Expeditionary Force have taken the first action here towards the formation of an association of veterans of the World War similar to the GAR. A caucus was called to design the machinery for a national convention in America next year, and the election of delegates to that convention from the forces now in France.' 
Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt is arranging for a caucus in the United States on April 12th. And that, dear listeners, is the formation of the American Legion. Headline, Treaty Ready Soon. League plan to be in it, says Wilson. No compromise, no surrender is his attitude now. President says plan to link League with treaty still holds. In Washington, opponents of the League are aroused by this announcement. And also on the same day. Headline, Biggest Airship Flies in England. The R-34 can carry fuel to travel to America and back without landing. Transatlantic race soon. Colonel Port tuning up his airplanes. General Seeley tells of a wonderful new machine. And the next day. Dateline, Tuesday, March 18, 1919. Headline. Brewers to make mild beer until halted by court. To have 2.75% alcohol. Council finds there is no authority named to pass on quantity of alcohol in beverages. Told to ignore rulings, manufacturers advise to disregard Internal Revenue Commissioner's interpretation of the issue. A <laughs> beer. And back in Paris. Headline. League of Nations document with peace treaty to be ready March 29. President gets his way. League covenant to be made an appendix to the treaty. Verbal changes suggested by friendly critics may be embodied in the protocol. And the next day? Dateline, Wednesday, March 19, 1919. Headline, British airmen coming to try Atlantic flight. Steamer is bringing them with airplanes to start from St. John, Newfoundland. Enter for $10,000 purse. Machine secretly built in haste for competition, scheduled to fly 2,500 miles. Now you might wonder why they're shipping the airplanes and the pilots over to St. John, Newfoundland in order to fly back to the UK. Well, that's the way the tailwinds blow. Headline, wait for brewers to test the law with 2.75% beer. Some reported already preparing to market products they have. Revenue Commissioner invites Attorney General to define what is, quote, intoxicating, unquote. And back in Paris? Headline, Wilson and Premiers in conference in effort to speed action on treaty. All the big peace problems reviewed. No final decisions made, but satisfactory progress is reported. League goes with treaty. And a final story. Headline. Report Japanese leaders have agreed with Wilson not to raise race discrimination issue at this time. And on the next day, a lot of the strife and argument about the peace conference comes to a head. Dateline. Thursday, March 20, 1919. Headline. Fine. Covenant revisions difficult. Peril seen in amendments might cause defeat of league plan, its advocates say. Proposed changes to be considered at early meeting of body that framed it. Likely to be insisted upon, the recognition of Monroe Doctrine is demanded. And rumors that Clemenceau quit are denied. Headline, rumor that Clemenceau quit denied in official quarters. Paris a rumor that Premier Clemenceau had resigned the portfolio of Minister of War was denied in official quarters this evening. And the British support Wilson's position that the League and the Peace Treaty are linked. Headline, Cecil holds League vital peace factor. The League, he says, can do nothing in America without our consent. And the story reads, Speaking for himself and the entire British delegation at the peace conference, Lord Robert Cecil, this afternoon made an emphatic statement to the effect that the covenant of the League of Nations must go into the preliminary peace treaty. This comes at this moment from England as the strongest possible backing of President Wilson's contention. 
And by Friday, apparently Japan has changed its mind. Dateline, March 21, 1919. Headline, Japan will seek equality clause. Delegates at Paris want at least recognition of rights of their nationals abroad. British oppose the plan. Australian and Canadian delegates voice strong objection on their own account. And those are some of the headlines in the papers a hundred years ago this week, in a world trying to adjust to the aftermath of World War I. And meanwhile, we may have actually uncovered the reason why, until the recent rise in craft breweries, American beer was just so terrible. Joining us now is Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Well, Mike, both from the headlines we just heard and from your post this week, it seems that for Woodrow Wilson, fighting the war seemed to have gone a whole lot better than fighting the peace. Now, Wilson's dream and hopes for what was going to come out of this terrible war was to cast the world in a new light of democratic self-determination rather than imperial imposition of rule on populations. Well, it seems like that dream is crumbling right before our eyes and things are falling back to business as usual, with the spoils from breaking up the empires that lost the war simply becoming a different slicing of imperial pie. This has got to be just a devastating time for Wilson, doesn't it, Mike? Yes, it is, Teo. This week the headlines read, Peace, European-style, hypocritical fiction, a Vesuvius of vituperation. Even the Japanese take up the cry, and this is special to the Great War Project. In Paris, President Wilson makes a public announcement that the League of Nations Covenant would not be detached from the peace treaty and persuaded a plenary session of the peace conference to ratify that stance. So writes historian Thomas Fleming. And with that, imperialism raises its ugly head. The Allies turn their attention to carving up the spoils, the remains of the now vanished Austro-Hungarian Empire its colonies around the world, as well as the territories in the Middle East of the collapsed Ottoman Empire. Events at the peace conference in Paris are making it difficult for Wilson to hew closely to the 14 points, the principles he espoused in his famous 14-point speech during the war. So began the game, Fleming writes, of breaking Wilson's resistance to the Europeans' version of peace. Tensions at the negotiating table are high. Wilson clings to his principles, including self-determination, especially on the part of smaller nations. But the Allied victors of the war are having none of it. The British make the first move to challenge self-determination. A stunned Wilson resisted at first, reports Fleming, but he found himself on shaky ground. The League and the 14 points called for a disarmament program. Next, French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau began making outrageous demands on Germany. Eventually, Wilson agrees to French occupation of the Rhineland in western Germany and the German coal mines in the Saar, where 650,000 Germans have lived for a thousand years. This is compensation for the French coal mines the Germans destroyed during the war. The Italians soon got into the act, Fleming reports, now insisting on Fiume at the head of the Adriatic as a city they must have, although the acquisition would deprive the new nation of Yugoslavia of its only deep border port. Wilson is appalled. He ignored them all and many more and asked the Italians to exhibit to the newly liberated peoples across the Adriatic that noblest quality of greatness, the preference for justice over interest. A Vesuvius of vituperation from the Italian press that descended on Wilson, from the Alps to Sicily. Even in the United States, the Italian language newspapers took up the anti-Wilson cry. Next, it is the Japanese who abandoned all pretense to idealism, as everyone else was doing. They demand the big four's approval of their takeover of substantial territories in eastern China and the port of Qingdao. Here was imperialism at its most naked. Neither China, the nation that possessed the territory, nor the 20 million Chinese who lived there were to be seriously consulted. Although the Japanese claimed that the pathetically weak Chinese government had given its approval. To back themselves up, the Japanese flourished the secret treaty they had signed with the British and the French in 1917, promising all the Pacific islands colonized by the Germans north of the equator. And so it goes imperialism at its most naked, at the peace table in Paris. <laughs> 
what one historian calls hypocritical fiction. That's the news these days, a century ago, from The Great War Project. Mike Schuster is the curator for The Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. For our listeners who've been with us for a while, you know that a core theme for the podcast is highlighting how the once named, quote, forgotten war, unquote, is in truth the war that changed the world. How we can trace so much of the foundation of the 20th and even 21st century to this founding event. And our regular listeners also know that I'm not a historian. I'm just a very curious guy who's discovering all of this with you. Well, for months, especially as we started to look forward beyond the armistice, I've been captivated by the connection between this once obscure World War I and the pretty well-known and even famous follow-up events like the women's right to vote, prohibition, the roaring 20s, and one that I've been really interested in connecting the dots to, the giant crash of 1929 and the following depression. That's why I was so excited to come across an article that drew the lines between the Great War and the Great Depression. With us today is Professor Emeritus of History from the University of Rhode Island and author who's written about this, Professor Maury Klein. Maury, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Teo. Glad to be here. Maury, I was really excited to come across the article written in the History Channel by Christopher Klein. You were widely quoted in that article. So first question, Christopher Klein, Maury Klein, any connection? No relation, just a coincidence (laughs) of names. Very good. Well, could you give our audience a general overview of how the Great Depression and World War I are connected? There are several ways, the most obvious of which, of course, is the United States' refusal to join the League and to ratify the events that followed. But more in the economic sphere, it has to do with the effect of the war and particularly the treaty on world economic relations after the war. You may have gone over it earlier, in fact, that the Allies asked the Germans for what amounted to almost $33 billion in reparations. And to do that, they, of course, had to tell the Germans that you were guilty for the war and you have to admit you were guilty for starting the war. The other end of that spectrum, the United States had something like $10 billion in loans they had given to the Allies that they expected to be repaid. So that set up what became on the world markets, and particularly in the banking areas, a kind of circular event that just got worse and worse during the 1920s. In fact, if you want to go one step further, the whole thing of reparations and war loans plagued the countries really into the 1930s during the Depression. Maury, I've been really curious about another angle as well, more connected to the big crash of 29 than the global depression. In the U.S., the Liberty Loan Drives raised $16.7 billion, and that's $280 billion in today's dollars, all for the war effort. And another way to think of it is as a national capital infusion to help shift America from an agrarian to a manufacturing nation for the war. A lot of business was capitalized from that, and then the orders evaporated. Any connections? There's a very direct connection, and not just for manufacturing. One of the reasons why the farmer went into deep trouble after the war was because during the war, they'd gotten the highest prices they'd ever gotten for their goods because of the war demand. They then proceeded to go into debt to buy more land, to grow more goods, and then their orders evaporated, and they never recovered from that and forthcoming administrations during the 1920s did nothing to help them. The same thing happened to manufacturers who had expanded their facilities or built new ones for war orders, and then when those orders were cut off almost literally overnight, they were left hanging. They went and asked the government at least to give them some kind of tax break that enabled them to keep these facilities going. The government refused to do that. Well, and when you hit something like that, it does sort of like rumble for a half a decade plus, and then the trouble starts. But staying on that track with the giant money raise and people over-speculating, George Creel, Wilson's propaganda chief, and the government itself introduced the very concept of investment to the general public for the first time with the Liberty Loans. Any connection between the overinvestment on Wall Street in the following years? Again, there is a direct connection. Wall Street prior to the 1920s was very much private insider dealing only really with financial professionals. 
the general public did not only not invest in securities, they didn't know really what securities were. What the bonds did was to introduce them to a form of investment that they were not familiar with in most cases. And that was a very big step towards the 1920s when income started to rise, people had money to invest, and Wall Street started taking steps to show them how they could invest not only in bonds, but in stocks. To use the cliche of the times, it was the process by which Wall Street moved to Main Street. Well, so Maury, most people aren't real familiar with economics in general. And is there a simple takeaway that we should leave our audience with from the line between World War I, the Great Depression, and what's happening in the world today? There are a couple of those lines. They have to do with the tendency to go down the wrong streets in terms of policy. The United States, when it reacted to Wilson, it elected a series of Republican administrations who followed certain policies that were to aggravate what was to come. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea. One of those was to create the highest tariffs, which certainly messed up world trade. It also aggravated the whole circle between reparations and war loans. It was also a period of taxes that favored the well-to-do as opposed to the not well-to-do. Right at the time when the United States was creating its first full-blown consumer economy, and one of the basics, we now have an economy that's 70% consumer. One of the basics of a consumer economy is that consumers need money or they won't buy things. One of the other links that came out of the war was a new approach to banking, which extended what we now call consumer credit and personal credit, which was a very, very primitive thing prior to the war. Well, that's a fascinating subject. Thank you for coming in and talking to us about this today. I mean, obviously, we're scratching the very surface of a very deep subject, but thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Professor Maury Klein is Professor Emeritus of History from the University of Rhode Island and author of a number of books. We have links in the podcast notes for the article from the History Channel that we came across and a list of Professor Klein's publications. From economics to a very human note. Regular contributor historian Dr. Edward Lengel has an inspiring story for us this week about a pioneering American woman doctor who served in World War I and much, much more, Dr. Alfreda Withington. Motivated by personal tragedy to become a doctor, but prevented by her own country from pursuing advanced medical work, Dr. Alfreda Withington set down her professional roots in the German and Austro-Hungarian empires She returned to the United States just in time to apply her expertise among American and Allied troops on the Western Front in World War I. Born in 1860 in Germantown, Pennsylvania, Alfreda Withington learned from an early age that she would have to fight hard to get a formal education, let alone a professional career. Fortunately, she was a fighter. Encouraged by her book-loving father and her mother, who had never been permitted to earn a degree, Alfreda attended a Quaker school in Germantown, earning high marks, and then earned admittance to Cornell University when she was only 17. But then tragedy intervened in the form of the dreaded disease tuberculosis. Alfreda's sister had already died of TB, and in 1877 her father died too. Even as she began her studies at Cornell, Alfreda learned that her beloved brother George was fatally ill with the disease. The anguish she felt at her inability to fight tuberculosis led Alfreda Withington to a life-changing decision. She would become a doctor. The road wouldn't be easy. Graduating from Cornell in 1881, she entered the New York Infirmary's Women's Medical College, a tiny institution that had been founded by two earlier pioneers, doctors Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell. Alfreda Withington graduated in 1883, but after a successful internship at the infirmary, she was denied the opportunity to apply for a permanent position by the male doctors who ran the institution. Unfazed, she left for Europe to spend several years studying and working in Vienna, Berlin, and then Zurich. Although she encountered prejudice there as well, Alfreda Withington's ability was so phenomenal that she eventually became not just a doctor, but an accomplished surgeon. Returning to the United States, Dr. Withington spurned lucrative professional offers to become a country doctor in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where in wintertime she traveled the country on skis to visit her patients. 
After a hiatus working on a medical mission to impoverished fishermen and tuberculosis-plagued Eskimos on the rugged, storm-battered coast of Labrador, Dr. Withington returned to Pittsfield to set up a tuberculosis hospital and work with the American Red Cross. She was there when the United States entered World War I in 1917. Although she was no longer young, Dr. Withington determined to take her services to the front as quickly as possible. The Red Cross obliged, making her chief of a hospital, tending to sick and wounded soldiers at Drew in France. There, and in a subsequent position with the Rockefeller Commission devoted to civilian refugees, Dr. Withington tended to patients with a variety of illnesses, including tuberculosis and influenza, brought on by war's ravages. To be close to patients, she later wrote, to enjoy their confidence is very satisfying, and many, by their endurance of suffering, by their courage in facing the inevitable, set an example never to be forgotten. Sadly, heart troubles forced Dr. Withington to depart France before she felt her work there was over. But more work, perhaps equally important, awaited her in the United States. Shortly after returning home, she saw an ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association reading, Wanted, a woman physician, for settlement work in the remote Kentucky mountains. All calls to be made on horseback, no other licensed physician within 25 miles. Alfreda Withington did not hesitate. She would spend the remainder of her professional career at the Big Laurel Medical Settlement, high in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, tending to coal miners, farmers, and their families, applying many of the lessons she had learned as a pioneering woman doctor on the Western Front. Dr. Edward Langell's blog is called A Storyteller Hiking Through History, and it's filled with historical accounts of people that provides really wonderful and nuanced insights into bygone times. We have links to Ed's post and his author's website in the podcast notes. Since this week is St. Patrick's Day, we thought we'd do a segment on the Irish and Ireland and their seat at the table during the peace conference. The bottom line is they didn't have one. The United States is home to a lot of Irish immigrants. As a matter of fact, we learned really recently that my own wife's family was driven here by the potato famine in Ireland. Almost from the moment of the armistice, Irish Americans began petitioning Congress and the president to advocate for Irish nationhood as a part of the peace treaty. Sinn Féin, the separatist party in Ireland established in 1905, won the election across Ireland in 1918 and declared an independent Republic of Ireland in January of 1919. Now, Great Britain is not thrilled and refuses to recognize the new state, which cleverly tries to leverage the Paris Peace Conference to gain international recognition. Smart. Wilson's call for democratic self-determination is like a siren's call. And this puts Wilson into yet another pickle. Irish Americans are a key voting bloc in the Democratic Party. Great Britain is a key international ally who seriously has no intention of giving up any part of their empire. Francis Clemenceau, who needs Britain, doesn't want to support Ireland at the expense of their aggressive reparation front against Germany. On March 4th, 1919, just over a hundred years ago, in the United States, the U.S. House of Representatives passes a measure supporting Irish nationalism, 216 votes to 49. Now, unfortunately, the Irish-American overzealous cries in favor of an independent Irish republic does more harm than good. England's Lloyd George toughens his resistance, and slams the door on any chance of a delegation from Ireland making a formal presentation to the conference. And that eventually benefits Republican senators in opposing the ratification of the Versailles Treaty. Oi, there's no pot of gold at the end of this rainbow for Woodrow. We have references and links for you in the podcast notes to learn more. Well, we've spent a big chunk of the show in 1919, so now let's fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. As our regular listeners know, this part of the podcast is about now and how World War I is being remembered and commemorated 
written about and discussed, taught, and learned. Here is where we continue to spotlight the surprisingly numerous and significant remembrance and commemoration activities surrounding World War I and World War I themes. In commission news and education, on May 10, 1917, just over a month after America declared war on Germany, the American Commission on Public Information began publishing a daily newspaper every day except Sunday, published at the request of President Woodrow Wilson by a guy named George Creel. Now, we're going to do a whole episode on George coming up in a few weeks. Suffice it to say that he was the administration's propaganda chief. Anyway, we'd just started to produce this podcast, and this official bulletin popped up in our story research. I got really excited about this because no one had ever mentioned the official bulletin to me. What a find! A daily 7 to 12 pages of information that the American administration wanted to put out publicly about the war. Well, it turns out that there were parts and pieces of this official bulletin spread out all over the internet. So our mighty World War I Centennial Commission interns assigned to my team started to hunt them down and collect them for us. Initially, just as a great way for us to tell the story on the podcast about how the government was selling this whole war to the nation. But we started to get addicted to reading the bulletin. So we wanted to share our addiction. We gathered up as much of this resource as we could find and broke it out into daily publications and started to republish them every day on the centennial of their original publication date you know, as a primary research source for teachers and learners and history buffs. Well, our daily expanding official bulletin archive built its own following. Sadly, last month on February 4th, we ran out of issues and I started to get emails. Where's my bulletin? Now, we knew there were some more out there because Dave, one of our current researchers, came across some. So I asked one of the original interns who's still in touch with me, Drew Lorelli, if he could help us and finish out the project. I'm excited to tell you that the official bulletin is publishing daily again on the website at www.cc.org bulletin, all lowercase. And we're good through the end of this month. That means we will have published every issue from Volume 1, Issue 1, through Volume 8, Issue 575. Well, we know they shut it down very soon to now, and we're trying to hunt down the last issues for you. It's a really great resource. From the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission at www.cc.org slash bulletin, all lowercase. And the link is in the podcast notes. For Spotlight on the Media There was a new piece of music commissioned as a part of the centennial commemoration of World War I by Music Viva, the Master Chorale of Washington, and the New Orchestra of Washington. It was a cantata. Oh, what is a cantata? By definition, a cantata is a narrative piece of music for voice with instrument accompaniment, typically with solos, chorus, and orchestra. The cantata came to prominence with those that were created by Johann Sebastian Bach. Not to undersimplify it, but think of it as opera light without the stage play. This one is called Cantata and Crimson Roses Once Again Be Fair, and it's based on the writings of some of the most famous poets of the time, including Siegfried Sassoon, Alfred Lichtenstein, and Charlotte Mew, among others. In the program description, we find the following. Cataclysm. The one-word description of the tragedy of World War I, which led to the deaths of tens of millions of human beings in battlefields from the Marne to the Middle East. Well, we should mourn this cataclysmic event and continue to draw lessons from it. With us today to provide some insight into this piece are the creative team behind it. 
Alejandro Hernandez Valdez, and Joseph Turin. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Teo. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, Alejandro, Joseph, can you tell me the story of how this commission came about and its premiere on the centennial of the armistice? Yes. Everything started with someone deeply connected to your organization, Philip Masada. And as you well know, he's an expert on World War I poetry. So every time we got together, the topic of World War I would come up. He said to me, you know, the centennial of World War I is coming in a couple of years. So why don't we start thinking about what we can do with the orchestra? Eventually, you know, as we got closer to the date, I started thinking about possible ideas. And the most obvious idea was to commission a work by a renowned composer. Around that time, I met Joseph, who I call Joe. I think he came to one of our musical world concerts, and we met after the performance, and then we set up a time to have lunch, and we started talking about this commission. Alejandro and I met a few times for lunch. I did go to your Music of Viva concert. I was really impressed with what I heard. During our last lunch together, he presented this idea to me, and I thought, wow, what a great idea. I we talked about a 20 to 25 minute piece. We discussed the orchestration a little bit. As far as the texts, we thought it might be interesting to find texts that represented the different countries that were involved during World War One. First poem I found was by a British nurse named Vera Brittan, who had lost her fiance. He had proposed to her and was killed four weeks later. And she went off. She became a pacifist and a poet. She wrote a poem called Perhaps. And I just came across it by chance. And there was one line in the poem that just grabbed me. And it was, and crimson roses once again be fair. And I thought, this is the title of the piece. Of course, I used her poem in the piece. And this led me to just explore as many pieces as I could find. And I did discover a tremendous amount of poetry, but I wanted the piece to be diversified. I wanted it to be contrasting. A lot of the music would be of a somber quality, and I didn't want too much of that to occur throughout the piece. That research took me longer than actually writing the piece. I think I spent about six months doing research, and the piece was composed basically probably in half that time, probably two to three months. And that's how it all happened. What from this experience stands out for you personally? I was familiar, of course, with the tragedy of World War I and the impact around the world. But as a musician who only peripherally deals with text, this project, what it did to me, it made me discover all this wonderful poetry that I didn't know and that speaks about the events in such a real way. And it puts them right in front of you. I remember first getting the selection of poems that Joe had decided to use. I was just blown away, and I remember I was so moved by it, I had to text him right away. Well, Joe, what about for you? The emphasis for me was the poetry itself, which obviously was the inspiration for the music. I think someone that I had known had seen a portion of the cantata and said, when I wasn't angry, I cried. And I thought that was very powerful because I felt the same way. There's so much sadness in these pieces, just about the absurdity of how easy it is to go to war and to create havoc on your fellow human being. And these men were thrown into the situation and had to kill each other. There was a German poet that I used, Alfred Lichtenstein, and he died at the age of 25 in 1914, killed in battle. And 28 years later, his mother and siblings were murdered by the Nazis. If anything, I probably felt that if there was a way to prevent these kinds of incidences, maybe there is the lesson somewhere. It's such a beautiful piece. If somebody would like to hear it, how can they do that? Well, if you go to YouTube and you type in the title of the piece, which is And Crimson Roses, once again, be fair. It should take you to that particular video and some other videos, too. Excellent. And is it going to be performed again? I hope to perform it again. I've told Joe that I am enamored with the piece. I really believe in it. And there's a possibility of a performance at the Victoria Park Festival in 2020. 
I am the district director of the Victoria Bach Festival in Victoria, Texas. And we love to do new works. And certainly that is the next time up for me. We also talked about recording, which is a possibility. If somebody wanted to, as we come back around to the 101st anniversary of the Armistice, how would they go about contacting one of you all to get the rights to perform it? Well, the piece is not published, so it would probably be through me or Alejandro to get the wheels turning, sort of. That probably would be the best way to do it. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming in today and talking with us and also for doing this wonderful work. Thank you, Teo, and thank you, Joe. It's, uh, again, yes, it's been a, an incredible is. journey from the start of this project all the way to the end. It's something that will stay with me for a while. Thank you both, and it's been a <laughs> nice interview. I re- really appreciate it. Alejandro Hernandez Valdez and Joseph Turin are the creative team behind the cantata and Crimson Roses Once Again Be Fair. We have a link for you in the podcast notes to where you can hear the performance of it, as well as the profiles of our guests. For Remembering Veterans, as we pointed out last week, March 13th was National K-9 Veterans Day. Although the U.S. didn't have an official K-9 Corps during World War I, That's something that happened officially on March 13th, 1942, 77 years ago. The unofficial dogs in the American Expeditionary Force were very much a part of World War I. And two of the most famous were Sergeant Stubby, a proclaimed American hero, and Rags the Terrier from the 1st Infantry Division. And as we said we would, for K-9 Veterans Day, we posted a Facebook poll where people got to vote for Rags or Stubby as the 2019 World War I K-9 Hero of the Year. And the results are in. May I have the envelope, please? Thank you. And the winner of the 2019 World War I K-9 Hero by a decisive knockout punch of 68% versus 32% is... Stubby, an American hero. (laughs) I guess it helps if you have an animated feature film out there about you. Welcome to our regular segment, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. Now, in honor of Sergeant Stubby, today's speaking World War I word is, what else? Dogfight. The term isn't new. It's been used for centuries to describe a fierce, fast-paced battle between two or more opponents. However, the term's usage for air combat can be traced back to the late years or maybe just after the end of World War I. One of the first known written references to dogfight for aerial combat comes from a book called Fly Papers by an author named A.E. Illingsworth, published in 1919. Quote, The battle developed into a dogfight, small groups of machines engaging each other in a fight to the death. Now, when we hear the term dogfight in reference to airplanes, it conjures up images of mano-a-mano combat, the skills of one flyer versus the other. This is very different from the sort of mass-produced, nearly industrial death so rampant in World War I trench warfare. And the man, often referred to as the father of aerial combat tactics, was a German officer named Oswald Bolke, who led one of Germany's first fighter squadrons, but after 40 dogfights, was shot down himself at the age of 25 on October 28, 1916. Dogfight, an old term for intense one-on-one combat and applied to aerial combat late in the war, and today's word for speaking World War I. We have links for you in the podcast notes. And that wraps up episode number 114 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News Podcast. Well, thank you for listening. We want to thank our great guests, crew, and supporters, including Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Maury Klein, educator, author, and rumor has it, likes acting, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, 
orchestra director and conductor Alejandro Hernandez Valdez, and composer Joseph Turin. Congratulations to Sergeant Stubby, the official winner of our 2019 World War I Dog Hero Award. Thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our interview editing team. Katz Laszlo, the line producer for the show. J.L. Michaud and Dave Kramer for research and script support. A special shout out to Drew Lorelli for bringing our official bulletin site up to date. And I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators, their classrooms, and the public. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as our other sponsors, the Star Foundation, the General Motors Foundation, as well as the good people of Walmart. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org forward slash cn for Centennial News. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. And the other day I tried it on my iPhone and Siri knows what that means. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, keep the story alive for America by helping to build the memorial. Just text the letters WWI or WW1 to the phone number 91999. I got the guy who used to be my captain working for me. He wanted work, so I made him a clerk. In my father's factory And by and by I'm gonna have him wrapped in work up to his brow When he comes into the office He gets up on his seat Stands at attention And gives me his seat Who was it said revenge is sweet I got my captain working for me now Thank you for listening. So long.